In 540, Belisarius returned to Constantinople from Italy after defeating the Ostrogoths and bringing the peninsula back into the Roman Empire. It was the second time that the great general had returned to the capital after expanding the empire's borders. He had done the same in 534 when he conquered the Vandals and had received a triumph and a consulship. But this time would be different. There would be no victory parade, no honorary appointments. This time, after expanding the Roman Empire to the west, he would need to defend it in the east. Around the same time that Belisarius landed in Constantinople, messengers from Mesopotamia arrived with news of the Sasanian sack of Antioch. Belisarius would not have time to rest on his laurels. He would be sent eastward to deal with this new threat. Khosrow's invasion of 540 had been a major success, but he did run into a little trouble on the tail end. On his march back into Sasanian territory, he had stopped at Dara and undertook a short siege. However, by this point, Martinus had returned from Italy and had brought reinforcements to the fortress city. Martinus was able to successfully hold Dara, but he did pay Khosrow a small sum to break off the siege. But this minor attack had broader effects. After sacking Antioch, Khosrow had agreed to go home in return for a hefty sum of gold up front, as well as an annual tribute from Justinian. But as I said in the last video, Khosrow continued to extract money from Roman cities during his return march. This only stopped when he got to Dara. For Justinian, Dara was the last straw. If Khosrow wasn't going to peacefully return home, Justinian wasn't going to pay him. The annual tributes would never be sent, and the Romans would consider the two empires to be at war. Belisarius' first order of business in the east was to reorganize the army. Many of the men he had been given to fight with were raw recruits. They were not the experienced soldiers that he had taken to Africa or to Italy. They would need to be trained and properly armed. But it wasn't only rookies. Belisarius also had Gothic warriors, men who had been shipped to the east from the conquered Italian territory, just as Kostro had feared. And Belisarius also had a few thousand Ghassanids under their king, Erethus. The Ghassanids, remember, were a Roman client kingdom rivaled by the Lachmids, who were a Sasanian client kingdom. While he trained his new recruits, Belisarius sent spies into Persia to gather information about Khosrow's movements and his strength. These spies brought back some very good news. The Sasanian army and the king were off in the north fighting off an invasion from the Huns. With this information, Belisarius held a meeting with his officers to determine the best plan of attack. Belisarius and most of the other generals favored an invasion while Kosro was preoccupied. The only dissenters were the commanders from Syria, who feared that the Lachmids would be able to strike at the Ghassanids and the Roman frontier if they took their forces off the border and sent them on this invasion. Belisarius countered that it was currently a holy season for the Lachmid Arabs, and that they would not send raiding parties during this time. He ordered the generals from Syria to accompany him on the invasion, but he promised them that they would be allowed to break off and return home after 60 days, at which point the Lachmids would be free from their religious obligations and more likely to raid. As Belisarius prepared this invasion, he did not know that he had been duped by faulty intelligence. The spies were right when they told him that Khosrow was in the north, but they were wrong when they told him that Khosrow was fighting the Huns. This was a rumor that the king had planted to hide his true agenda an invasion of Lazica. 
Lazica was a Roman client state with some autonomy, but the Lazi had been growing weary of the Roman administration. While the Romans and the Sasanians were at peace through the later half of the 530s, Justinian had taken the opportunity to reorganize his eastern provinces. As a part of this reorganization, he had appointed John Zibis, the Magister Militum in Armenia, in the mid-530s. John built his command post at Petra and meddled heavily in Lazi trade. And I mean heavily. He essentially made himself a middleman so that all imported goods moved through him, so that he could get rich selling off goods to the Lazi at inflated prices. This obviously made the people very upset, so they began looking to buddy up to Kosro, and by 541, Gubazes II, the king of Lazica, had invited the Sasanians to take the region. So Kosro was moving his army into the kingdom to kick the Romans out and to take the territory for himself. He entered Lazica and met Gubazes, who informed him of the Roman stronghold at Petra. Kosro advanced his army towards Petra, but word got back to John that an enemy force was approaching. John ordered his forces to hide behind Petra's walls out of sight of the approaching Sasanians. Kosro's scouts reported that the fortress seemed to be empty and Kosro thought that he would have an easy victory. He ordered his army forward with rams leading the way to break open the gates. But as the army approached the walls, John sprung his trap. His garrison rushed out of the city and launched a surprise attack, inflicting significant damage on the shocked Sasanians. Before the enemy could regroup, they then rushed back to safety behind the city's walls. Kosro was furious when this happened, and he ordered one of his officers impaled as a punishment for the failure. The Sasanian army, though, was able to regroup and launched another attack, this time prepared for the Roman defenses. They did not breach the walls, but John was killed towards the end of the day's fighting. And this was a major blow for the morale of the garrison. The Sasanians returned to camp for the night, but under cover of darkness, tunneled underneath the base of one of the city's towers and started a fire, weakening the tower, leading to its eventual collapse. The Roman garrison knew they couldn't survive this, and they surrendered to Kosro. Many of them even agreed to join the Sasanian army. Meanwhile, Belisarius, unaware that Kosro had entered Lazica, marched his army into Sasanian territory and approached Nisibis. He made camp well outside the city, hoping to bait the Sasanian garrison into attempting a sally. Belisarius felt that his army would fare better in an open field as opposed to attacking a well-fortified position. Most of the sub-commanders agreed with Belisarius' strategy, but a general named Peter felt differently and moved his men closer to the city walls. Because for some reason there's always someone that thinks they can do a better job than Belisarius. The next morning, Belisarius prepared for battle, believing that the Sasanians would attack around midday. The Sasanian army knew that the Roman army would typically break for food around this time, and that made midday the more likely time to launch an attack. Belisarius noticed that Peter had created his own little advance party, and he sent word to these men to be prepared for the attack at midday as well. But of course, Peter and his men were in their own little world and ignored the orders. So right on schedule, they broke for food. And at the perfect time, the Sasanians stormed out of Nisibis and drove Peter's camp into chaos. Belisarius saw this happening and sent the rest of the army in relief, forcing the enemy to retreat to the safety of the walls. The problem, though, was that they had already routed Peter's unprepared army, 
and because they were so close to the city, they were able to get to safety before Belisarius' relief force could do enough damage to make a dent in the defenses. So the Romans had basically shown their hand, but didn't get the benefit that Belisarius was hoping for. The small skirmish sent a clear signal to the Sassanian garrison that they were best served by remaining inside Nisibus's walls. Belisarius felt that his hope of drawing them out into an open battle was now lost, and the Romans would need to move on. He marched his army further into Sasanian territory and approached Sasaurnon, where the garrison was low on supplies, partially as a result of Khosrow's invasions. The Romans launched an initial attack on the walls, but took heavy losses. Learning from escapees that the supplies in the city were very low, Belisarius chose instead to wait the garrison out. In the meantime, his Ghassanid allies under Arethas, and some of his own personal guard under John the Glutton, super great nickname there, were sent out to raid Sasanian territory on the other side of the Tigris River. After sending the raiding party out, Belisarius opened negotiations with the Sasanian garrison inside Sasaurinan and attempted to extract favorable terms on the starving population. The garrison agreed to surrender if their lives would be spared, and Belisarius agreed to let them live. He instead sent many of them to Constantinople, where they were conscripted into the Roman army and sent to Italy to fight the now insurgent Ostrogoths. So the Romans would have the Ostrogoths fighting for them in Persia, and the Sasanians fighting for them in Italy. The raiding party was highly successful during this time, with the bulk of the Sasanian army in Lazica, and the remainder defending the various important border cities against potential attacks from Belisarius' army. They were basically running free. The plan was for them to return to the Roman camp, but Arethas had reservations. He knew that if he returned to Belisarius, the Romans would take a share of the spoils that his men had won. And he didn't want that. He wanted it all for himself. So he concocted a little ruse. He ordered some of his scouts to ride out of camp one morning and return with news of an approaching Sassanian army. This sparked a small panic in the Roman camp. They were only a small fraction of the entire Roman force, and they couldn't handle an attack from a large Sasanian army, which, seemingly, was cutting them off from Belisarius. Arethas met with John, and it was decided that John and his men would retreat back to Roman territory via a long and indirect route to avoid potential contact with the Sasanians, and Arethas would take his men quickly back to Ghassanid territory. Now, there was no Sasanian army, but only Arethas knew that. So everyone went along with the plan, retreating quickly and quietly, and without getting any word back to Belisarius. And that was a problem because Belisarius was sitting outside Cesaronon, and he wasn't hearing anything from the raiding party. So he came to the logical conclusion that they must have been wiped out by the Sasanians. So now, he was stuck looking for a Sasanian army that didn't exist. He assumed it was out there, somewhere, but he had no intelligence on it. He was deep in enemy territory, with an enemy garrison at Nisibis behind him, and a phantom force seemingly in front of him. Somewhere. Anywhere. So, that would be bad. And there were other factors at play here too, but there is some contradiction in the historical accounts. I touched on this contradiction in my video on the secret history of Procopius, but I'll get into it again here. In History of the Wars, the primary account of this campaign, 
Procopius says that an illness was quickly spreading through the Roman ranks and that up to a third of the army was ill. Combined with the lack of news from the raiding party and the fact that his men from Syria didn't have much time left on their 60-day commitment, Belisarius decided that the campaign was too risky to continue, so he returned the army to Roman territory. But in the secret history, Procopius paints a different picture, claiming that there was, quote, underlying motives, unquote, behind the retreat. Here, Procopius claims that the retreat stemmed from a problem that Belisarius had with his wife, Antonina. He writes in The Secret History that Antonina was engaged in extramarital affairs, and that in the past, Belisarius had been unwilling to accept the truth, even when the evidence was right in front of him. Antonina also typically traveled with Belisarius when he went on campaign, with Procopius writing that, quote, she had always preferred to voyage wherever her husband went, lest he, being alone, come to his senses, and, forgetting her enchantments, think of her for once as she deserved." Unquote. But this campaign was different. She did not accompany Belisarius to the east, instead staying behind in Constantinople at the urging of the Empress Theodora, who needed her help on other matters related to the royal court. But while Antonina remained in the capital, her son from a previous marriage, Photius, served with Belisarius. At some point during this campaign, Photius told Belisarius about Antonina's infidelity, even providing testimony from eyewitnesses. And this time, Belisarius accepted the truth and became irate. So, as he stood outside Cesaronon and heard that Antonina's work with Theodora was complete and that she had set out from Constantinople to join him, he decided, according to the secret history, to retreat the army back into Roman territory so that he could meet up with his wife and place her under guard and eventually take revenge on her lover. The secret history goes on to tell us that Belisarius only sent a small raiding party across the Tigris because he wanted to be able to hurry back across the border once he got word that Antonina was on her way. Procopius writes that, quote, If he had been willing in the beginning to cross the Tigris with his entire army, I believe he could have taken all the plunder in the land of Assyria and marched as far as the city of Tessaphon with none to hinder him and he could have rescued the captured Antiochians and whatever other Romans misfortune had brought there and restored them to their native lands." Unquote. He was referring here to the citizens of Antioch who Khosrow had dragged back to Persia after the invasion of 540, the ones that settled at Way Antioch Khosrow. Now, maybe there is some truth here. Maybe. But I put a lot more stock in the version put forth in History of the Wars. Belisarius was in a tough spot. He didn't have great intelligence, and he knew it. He certainly didn't like being deep in enemy territory with fortresses behind him. And his army was about to get smaller. I just think that the retreat makes sense here. But it is possible that he was overcome with anger and let that dictate his actions. But whatever the reason, the Romans did retreat. The raiding party across the Tigris had been successful, and they did successfully siege Cisaronon. But overall, this invasion wasn't nearly as successful as Khosrow's had been a year prior. And speaking of Khosrow, he was up in Lazica when he heard of Belisarius' invasion. He assigned a small garrison to hold Petra and began his march back to Persia. But by the time he returned, it was too late in the year to launch another offensive. So he began planning his next move, but would have to wait until 542.